So what I will do now is I will take some questions from some of the centers for about half an hour so that on any of the sessions that we have had since the morning. Wales University. Uh, sir, uh, this type of classrooms uh, where uh, we have it available in our universities, then how to manage the working hour of every individual faculty that is increased or that may be decreased? So, if I understand, the question is does it affect the working hours of the faculty? Okay, so the working hours of the faculty is going to increase in terms of preparation. Okay, there is no getting around that because you have to construct these questions and these activities which you have not got yet. I mean, we are right now in the process through these workshops, what we are doing is we are creating repository. So, all the think pair share questions that you have submitted as part of the assignment will become available to everybody so that not everybody needs to create these activities. Similarly, the peer instruction questions we will make available to everyone. So, that part of preparation for an instructor will increase, but the part of the lecture preparation will decrease. So, you need not prepare so much about what are you going to say in the class. So, typically when I take a class, I am usually lecturing only for the you know first, first 10 minutes there is some activity which is usually a peer instruction question. Then there is some 10 minutes of lecture which summarizes the understanding that is required for that peer instruction activity. Then there is a major think pair share activity for the concept that they have to learn in that particular uh, session. And there is one more 10 minutes lecture which is for summarizing that particular uh, think pair share activity. So, in a class of one and a half hours, I usually am lecturing for less than 10 minutes plus 10 minutes and one more 10 minutes. Okay. Divai Patil, Pune. Uh, sir, uh, when we ask the students to read the video and when they go through it, uh, next day their attendance will be very less. So, how can we improve the attendance of the students? Okay. Over to you. Okay. So, the question is that if the attendance is less because they have already seen the video. So, the point is that we want to help students understand this idea that what is there in the video is not going to come in the exam. Okay, what is there in the video is a precursor to what is going to come in the exam. So, it is like the video is simply going to explain what is an iteration, what is a loop. But in the exam, they have to actually write a program which involves a loop. So, the moment they understand this point, they are going to realize that only if they come to class, they can get it easily. So, essentially if you look at it from a student's perspective, the total amount of effort that a student puts in a normal classroom is the same as in a flipped classroom. Okay. So, what is happening is in a normal classroom, they are listening to the information in the class and solving the problems outside of class. So, the total amount of time is 1 hour plus 1 hour let us say. In the flipped classroom, they are listening to information outside the class for less than 1 hour and spending 1 hour in the class where their peers and teachers are available for help in order to develop mastery over the content. So, once we get this idea across to the students that the flipped classroom is required for them to get mastery and to do well in the exam, you will find that they will start coming to the class instead of simply saying that oh the video is there, I will look at the video just before the exam. Bengal engineering. A uh, lot of time we see the students are reluctant enough to uh, go home and uh, watch lectures and even uh, complete their assignments. How do you think we should motivate the students to do so? Yeah, so we will have to be creative here as teachers, we have to figure out ways. So, going home and doing the assignment, so how do you think we are motivating the participants in this uh, workshop? So, we have to use mechanisms like that, that okay, unless you submit the assignment, you won't get that or you have to say that look, this is required in order for you to learn, gain mastery. So, there are really no other ways. Mount Zion. Uh, for affiliated colleges with students who find it difficult to watch videos and understand things, would that be useful sir or could we read them in some other way? Okay, so the question is about watching videos and understanding. So see, it is, I am not saying that every class should be a flipped class. Okay, what I am saying is that the active learning part of, there should be active learning that happens in every class. So let us say your students do not have access to videos. 
Okay. Let us say you have to do the information transmission part also in the class itself, you do not have a choice. Let us say that is the situation in which your college in your locality you are working in. Okay. So, what you could do is instead of suppose you have a one hour class, instead of doing information transmission for the entire one hour, what you could do is you could do information transmission for 10 minutes, where you can explain whatever would have been there in the video and then do the activity that you have designed to help the students achieve mastery over that content and then again do some information transmission, again do another activity. So, that is the way you know even if students do not have access to videos or so it is not like students must have seen the video before they come to the class. You can take an initial part of the class to recap what was there in the video and even if you do 10 minutes of active learning in your class. But in every class, you know, some different way, you know, have a peer instruction question, let students talk to each other, do a poll, or have a small think pair share activity. You will find that your students' engagement with the content increases, your students' learning also increases. Double one zero seven. Sir, we wish to know what is the most adequate frequency of implementing a flipped classroom mode in a semester of like uh, 50 lectures per subject or 40 lectures per subject. Okay, two things that you could do. One is for some of the lectures which for which videos are easily available and which your students can watch the videos, you can implement those lectures as flipped classrooms, where you ask the students to watch the lectures outside of class and only do active learning activities in the class. For other topics where you are unable to find good videos for students to watch. What you could do is what I just said earlier that spend some time doing lecturing or information transmission and then spend some time doing the active learning activity. So, think of it as though you have created the video and you are playing the video yourself in the first 10 minutes of the class and then also create the activity which you will be able to then execute in the class. So, what you will find is even if you spend 10 minutes per class doing some active learning technique, you will find that your students are benefiting. So, that is all that you need to do to begin with. Kurukshetra University. Uh, suppose one has to, uh, suppose one has to do empirical research on flipped classroom versus traditional classroom, how to measure it, how to prepare the questionnaire for that. Okay. So, the answer to this question is actually out of scope of this course. You know, we do an entire two week workshop on how to do research with various educational technologies. Let me just give you a quick answer. So, some of these resources are there on our website. So, if you go to uh, my home page, you will find links to various resources that you can use. The Let me just give you a quick two minute answer. What you could do is you basically have to find ways of measuring various things. For example, student learning as well as student perceptions. Okay. So, measure both of these things, how to measure them, there are standard ways of constructing surveys and so on. So, all of these resources you will find on our education technology department website and you can use that to create them. Even the videos of those workshops are actually available. So, if you go to the, the website of uh, this talk to teacher program, so this is the program where all these workshops are being recorded you will find that in February of 2013, we conducted this workshop. So, if you look at those videos, they will give you actual ideas on how to do that research. NITTR Chandigarh, yes, please go ahead. That you have told that videos are uh, most advantageous for the students for the fifth classroom concept. Now, there are the, some levels of the students. For example, not only the degree level, there are some students who are in the diploma level. And uh, the level of the student such that we sometimes get that he is not in a position to grasp the video. Then for those students, what do you suggest that in the next class, the, what the teacher should do? Okay, so the question is if the student is not able to grasp the video. So, one thing is that maybe the creation of the video has to change. You have to create simpler videos for those students. Okay, because if we are simply going to repeat the explanation in the class, then there is no point in the student having watched the video. You might as well just do it in the class itself. You might as well simply just give the explanation at a low level and do a small active learning activity which will help the students to understand it. So, 
one thing is you must encourage the student to watch the video multiple times till they are able to grasp it. Second thing is to create videos which are simpler and if both of these solutions fail, then there is no option but for you to abandon the videos and do the lecture in the class. Personal engineering college, sir. So what incentives uh, we can give for the students for uh, preparing this uh, flipped classroom? Sir? Okay, so what incentives can we give to students for preparing for the flipped classroom? So the key thing is there are two ways in which we can do incentives. One is we can tell them what is the benefit that they will get. The other is we can tell them what is the penalty that they will have to pay. Okay. So from the benefit perspective, you can explain to them that totally you are going to, if you are going to put in one hour coming to the lecture and one hour of uh, preparation time at home, it is the same two hours. There is no additional work that you have to do except that we are changing the order in which you are doing things. You are watching the video at home and then you are coming to the class and solving the problem where you have the benefit of being able to, as soon as you have a doubt about how to solve a problem, you can raise your hand and you can get a teaching uh, assistant or the instructor to help with you or you can talk to your uh, friends. So this is the way in which you can convince students that there is a lot of benefit in this model of watching the video first and then coming to the class for doing the active learning. If that does not work, then you have to go for the penalty model where you say that look, I am going to give a quiz, first 5 minutes of every class of mine is going to have a quiz and unless you have watched that video, you will get, you are likely to get a 0 on the quiz. So because of the fear of getting 0 on the quiz, they will watch the video, at least they will skim through the video and come to the class. In both cases, your purpose can be served. EBET group of institutions. Sir, actually, my question is, we have different kinds of students, like slow learners and uh, average and good students. Uh, we are giving the assignments uh, like based on the students' level, and finally, we are uh, equalize them. That means, uh, for uh, example, good students is equal to the slow learners, and slow learners is equal to the good students. Uh, but uh, if we are changing the assignments and all means. Uh, finally, the exam questions will not match with each other. So, what can we do for uh, improving the slow learner uh, equal to the uh, good? So, what you will find is that when you do an active learning activity, it benefits everybody. So, the slow learners, often we may feel that slow learners and high achievers will not talk to each other. But then the high achievers develop a, an interest in teaching that concept to the slow learners. So this is this you actually see in a lot of classrooms when you implement these mechanisms. So students basically are able to help each other in order to improve the entire class. So what happens is the entire class average goes up. The high achievers also start getting a deeper understanding of the subject as well as the slow learners also get to multiple explanations. They can see the video or they can talk to the instructor, they can also talk to their peer. So they get multiple uh, explanations and multiple attempts in order to understand that subject. So everybody's achievement in that course actually goes up when we use active learning techniques even to the extent of 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes per class. LDRP Institute of, you can hear Good practice to allow students to watch video in the classroom and secondly I do activity in the classroom. Okay, so uh, asking students to watch the video in the classroom, perhaps if you do not have any other choice then it is okay because ideally they should watch the video before they come to the classroom because you do not want to waste your classroom time with students simply sitting there passively watching the video. So if it is a very short video, 10 minutes, then you can say that okay, we can do it in the classroom itself and then start the activity. But if it is anything longer than that, you will find that you know students tune out while simply watching the video, they are waiting for something else. But it is not wrong to do that. Techno India. How we can implement the flipping classroom uh, for the programming languages? That is C, Java, Python, like this. Okay. And second question associated with that also, that uh, there are two categories of students in class usually we find. Uh, one is those who, st uh, for those who believe in self-study and those who do not believe in self-study. So those who believe in self-study are good for uh, flipping the classroom method, but I think that those who do not believe in self-study 
uh, um, we're going to face some problem in flipping the classroom. Okay. Uh, so, so, can you suggest how to tackle that? Okay, so there are two questions. The first question is about how to do flip classroom for uh, programming type of topics. So, that's what I have given examples in the session earlier that you can show a video or you can create, there are a lot of videos available. I even mentioned the spoken tutorial website. So, if you google spoken tutorial IIT Bombay, you will go to a website where you will find lot of videos which are about uh, programming videos. So, these videos will simply talk about what the construct is and give some examples of how that construct can be used. Now, your students having watched these videos, what you can create are activities of the type that I have shown in my slide, where you can ask them to actually debug or even activities that we saw in the previous session, the peer instruction activities, which helps them to uh, discover whether they have actually understood the concept or not. So, many of you might have been surprised to find that you yourself got wrong answers to some of the questions in the peer instruction session. So, the same surprise will happen for any of your students when you create questions of that sort and then they will go deeper to learn that particular topic. Coming to the second question of students having self study versus students having group study mode. So, the flipped classroom model is not particular about what type of students they are. So, the only thing that may happen is students who prefer to do self study may not participate as much in the interaction in the classroom, but that is still ok as long as you are not forcing them to participate. No, they will talk to their neighbor certainly and if some student wants to work it out on his own without participating that is perfectly alright. It is not necessary that 100 percent of the students should participate. But by and large, as you do more and more of these activities in your classroom, you will find that more and more students start participating, even if they are self-learners. Dronacharya College. IITs have designed so many MOOC courses for different subjects. So, is there any MOOCs available for active online learning activities? Okay. So, is there any MOOC for active online learning? So, right now, we have not yet offered it. We will be offering it in December, January. Okay. So, uh, we, we have already got it in the timetable. So, active activities for various engineering courses, we will be offering it in December and January. Techno India, West Bengal. If we apply the flip classroom technology or technique, okay. the, flip, the flip class, okay. the flip classroom technique applied, then is there limitations that it can cause for us? So, this is a very broad question. I mean, I do not know what do you mean by limitations that a flipped classroom can cause for you. If you are just asking for me for a yes or no answer, I will say the answer is no, because if you do the flipped classroom technique properly, the way it is meant to be done, like what we have talked about, you know, implement the active learning along with it, it will only benefit your students. Okay. So, if you are going to simply do a flipped classroom as uh, having the students watch the video and only doing some clarification and some open ended discussion in the class then it is not going to give you much benefit beyond you giving the lecture in the classroom itself in the traditional manner. So, the entire power of flipped classroom or any other teaching technique comes when students are working with the content. So, the active learning part of it as long as you implement that you will find that the there are no limitations that students are only benefiting. Mukesh Patel school. Flip classroom is a very good idea sir. But the problem is that many of our college students do not have the resources to watch the video. In that scenario, how can we implement this on the larger crowd? So, again this is a question which has already been asked and answered that if the students do not have resources to watch the video, you do, do not need to implement the flipped classroom. As long as you are implementing some active learning technique in your class. So, let us say you lecture for the first 10 minutes, do an activity, lecture for another 10 minutes, do another activity you will be perfectly fine. Mufakam Jha. Yeah. I have two questions. My first question is we are an affiliated college and uh, the examination system is a stereotype university examination system. Whereas in flipped learning, flipped classroom, we are more concentrating on assimilation of knowledge and information. So how do you think this approach will also enable the students to be well prepared to appear so, it is an important question because the question is that if students have to write exams which are set by somebody else which are 
primarily promoting rote learning, what is the use of all these flipped classrooms and making uh, students gain mastery over the subject? No, so, there is really no good answer to that question. What we have to do is, as a group, we have to work. So, some of us are there on these exam setting committees. We have to start setting more and more apply level questions. We have to tell students that even though, so the only thing that I can tell my students is that doing the flipped classroom will definitely help you for that exam. It may be that you do not need to put in so much effort to crack that exam because that is going to have much simpler questions than what you are doing in the class, but it is definitely going to help you. It is not going to harm you from performing well in the exam, but you are putting in more effort which is good for you. I, and in parallel, we have to work with the university system to change the type of assessment questions from simply those that promote rote learning. So, this has started happening in some areas. So, for example, Bombay University now has a, a big exercise where there are a lot of teachers participating to come up with learning objectives and assessment objectives and doing it systematically. So, you can ask your second question now. Let me see if the audio is audible. Yeah, my second question is we face the problem of students coming late to the classes. So, when we are using a flipped classroom approach. Okay, so the question is about what to do when students are coming late to classes. So, this is pretty much what Professor Fatak is doing when centers are late to join at 9 a.m. No, so, one thing you can do is you can try to say that look this is not working for you, if you are late then this is the problem. So, one of the things that I do in my class when it is a live class, when students come late, so if it is let us say 9 o'clock, I say that okay, by 9 3 you have to be in and anybody who comes after 9 3 has to let us say for example, do 5 push ups before they can go to their seats. So, the moment you implement some uh, penalty of that sort, what you will find is students eventually nobody wants to be laughed at by their colleagues. So, they will all start coming on time. So, I typically need to implement this for my first two lectures. So, the first time I give a warning saying that look if you are you are late after 9 3 all of you stand here and then I let them off. The next time those who come late I make them do the penalty. So, sometimes I allow the audience to decide what the penalty is. So, they say that okay, you sing a song or dance something and so on. So, which also becomes a attention grabbing mechanism for the class at the same time it ensures that students do not come late. SKM Siyagar. Sir, my first question is if the class strength is uh, 60 to 80, how we can make it more effective this active learning strategy and uh, my second question is a student who required more effort to understand the technical concept and terms for them how we can uh, this again apply this active learning strategy. Okay. That is my second question. Okay. Over to you, sir. So, the first question is what to do in a large class. So, what we find is that these active learning strategies are quite independent of the size of the class because students are talking to each other. So, peer instruction for example, can work in a class of 5 students. It can also work in a class of 500 students because 2 students are talking to each other and learning more. Think pair share also, I have implemented think pair share in a class of 250 students because even in the share phase, we might think that the share phase is going to how will we get 200 students to share their ideas with their classroom. So, actually what happens is that like you saw when we were implementing the chat today, what happens is that the total number of ideas is not very many. So, if you say okay, how will you sort an array, you will find that most of the students will come up with one of three or four ideas and as and when these ideas come, you can say that you know those of you who have an idea which is similar to this need not speak. So, once you have all the different ideas on the board, you need not continue with the share phase. So, <clears throat> this is a very effective way of implementing active learning in a large class and it is only with a little bit of practice you will find that you are able to do this. Okay, the second question is what about students who are having difficulty with concepts and so on. So, there really is no good answer to that question. No? If you have videos, you can point them to those videos. If you have extra help sessions after your class, before your class, you can ask them to come for those sessions. Amrita school. How yes, do we ahead. ensure that higher cognitive skills are achieved to passive learners when we are having the assimilation in the class that, they, that is during the class hours? Okay, so both the techniques that we have talked about today of peer instruction, think pair share, creating activities which are of the design type, which are of conceptual understanding, 
all of these address the higher cognitive levels. So, any time you are making a student use the knowledge rather than simply recall the knowledge, you are forcing that student to work at a higher cognitive level. That is the simplest definition that you can take. So, any time you are forcing the student not simply recall what to do, but to actually create something. So, in programming it is very easy. The moment you say that okay, write a program for something or the moment you say that predict the output of a program, you are already making a student work at the higher cognitive level. Okay, so because the student has to use the knowledge rather than simply recall what is the knowledge. NIT. You are the best country and you have got the worst student to teach. And poor in quantity, you do not want to attend the class, you do not want to uh, listen, learn inside the class and if you sleep inside the class, what would you do at that position? Okay. So, the uh, question is what to do about a student who is absolutely not interested and refuses to be motivated to participate. Okay, so, the thing that we want to remember here is that no technique works for 100 percent of the students. Okay. So, what you want to do is, so there is a rule which is a thumb rule which says that if 80 percent of your students are able to acquire mastery over 80 percent of the topics that you are teaching, then you have done a good job of the teaching. So, for example, let us take today's session itself. I do not expect 100 percent of you to have understood all 100 percent of what I have said. But if 80 percent of you have understood 80 percent of what I have said, I think the sessions were successful. So, if there are students who are far outliers in terms of motivation, in terms of interest, in terms of you know effort that they are willing to put in on the subject, there really is nothing you can do. I mean you just have to leave them or you have to deal with them separately from the class. DMI college. Uh, does a blended learning flip classroom pedagogy help information literacy student in the long term adoption of research skills? Short answer is yes. In the morning session we had learned about the active learning. My question is about that. So, suppose if you are involving the student in doing a brainstorming kind of session, uh, so, there are some, always some kind of students who do not have any interest in uh, doing such activity or who, want, or who want to try to create some kind of a problems. My question is about how to deal with such students and whether it will not affect the seriousness of the studies. Okay. And another question is about if uh, we continue to do such kinds of active learning, so what about the completion of the syllabus, whether it will not be affected. Okay. So, uh, let me answer the second question first, completion of the syllabus. This question I have already answered earlier in the earlier session as well as when the chat came. So, I have already said that when you try it, you will find that it is you will be actually completing the syllabus ahead of time. It only appears to you that this is something additional that you have to do. It is actually something which substitutes a lot of lecturing time that you will otherwise spend on information transmission. Coming to the question on what about students who are disruptive in the class. So, this is an important question and because we are giving students the freedom to talk in the class, it may happen that they are talking about something else, they are cracking jokes, they are doing their Facebook activity or some of those things. So, what you could do is the only way that I am able to handle this is by requesting students that if you want to do that, do not do that in the class, at least let the ones who are serious participate. And eventually what you find is the serious students actually increase in number and these ones who which who are initially disrupting the class for just for the heck of disrupting the class, they become the minority and then they st at least they come to a level of either getting engaged with the classroom or they stop participating in the activity. So, it all depends upon how well we are able to you know get their buy in into the technique. Walchand. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hello sir, I have tried to read a technique for mobile technology subject, uh, I recommended uh, recommended students to watch video of mobile, uh, mobile technology from NPTEL uh, of uh, uh, Dr. Ranjan uh, Bose, uh, but normally students think that they can see video anytime. So, they come to lecture without watching videos. Uh, uh, how uh, is there any technique uh, 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 we can apply to motivate students to come to lecture by watching the videos we have uh, normally we, we have recommended. Okay, so one of the things is that when you look at NPTEL videos, these videos are usually long and it is known that students attention span for videos is not more than 10 minutes. So, since these videos are usually much longer videos, if you simply say watch the video and come, the student does not know what to do with watching the video, what part of the video to watch, what part of the video to not watch. So, what you can do is, you can do two things. 
one is you can give specific goals for the student you can say that okay watch from this minute to this minute and you can give a question that the student should be able to solve so the nptel videos themselves don't have these questions inbuilt into them but you can say that before watching this uh, while they are watching the video you can give them a set of questions say that okay you know find the answer to these questions by watching this video and then come to the class then you will find and you can say that you know you submit the answers in the class or take a small quiz in the class then you will find that they watch the video because now there is a purpose to watching the video simply telling them watch this video and come and if it's a long video you will find that they lose interest after a while and they say i will watch it just before the exam and they don't realize that 10 hours of video watching before the exam is not going to work very well yeah kme the understanding levels of the different students are different and in uh, in case of a live class we are able to adapt dynamically to the understanding levels of the students by like their reaction what will we do in case uh, okay so the the fact that understanding level of different students is different and we can adapt dynamically to them when we are doing an interactive class that's actually a myth okay we only think that we can adapt because there will still be a lot of students who are going to left get left behind but the moment you start doing this peer instruction or uh, any kind of active learning that is when students of all different understanding levels are able to participate so for example when you ask a peer so when i asked you the peer instruction question of uh, predict the output of a program in the previous session i could easily tell by looking at the response that there are 50% of the teachers themselves are not able to get that question correctly so that kind of information becomes available to you the moment you are doing some activity so automatically what you can do is you can tune your uh, remaining part of your session taking that information into account so that is the power of active learning it gives the teacher also real time feedback on what is the actual level of understanding of the student so we may think that looking at the student's face and seeing whether they are nodding or seeing whether they are writing tells us whether they are understanding that does not tell us whether they are understanding seeing whether they have been able to solve the problem is what tells us whether they have understood or not and that is where the peer instruction and think pair share activities can help you yeah ks rangaswamy hi uh, sir uh, my question is uh, we have a uh, different activities uh, for these things so you are flip class and other active learning and uh, we have we need to allot so much of time for that uh, in the lecture awards and all and then uh, our examination system is somewhat uh, always written oriented and uh, we don't uh, though we have tried hard to uh, pick up the students and students understanding and the comprehension uh, gets improved i admit at the same time uh, but uh, the uh, examination system is not in tune with the, uh, that what you are uh, suggesting uh, please uh, tell me that what the first question i have answered three times now saying that it's not going to increase the amount of time that you take when you implement okay and the examination question also i have answered in saying that unless that changes you have to convince your students so uh, there really is no new answer to give you ms pillai in case of syllabus change we may come across different subjects that is new to learn then in that case we can create a good code quality of video so what we can do in that case so if it is a new subject what you can do is you know if you are really keen on implementing it in the flip classroom mode you can create the video yourself so we have actually lab activities which we can put up i can share the link over moodle i mean it's not part of this particular ist course but i can share the link over moodle which will help you to create those videos yourself for your own flip classroom videos but by and large you will find that pretty much on any topic that we think is new there is somebody or the other who has created a youtube video on how that technology works or how that works and it's going to be very unlikely that you won't find a youtube video on that topic okay let me just take one last question college institute uh, good evening uh, first of all thank you for this session it's good to share the ideas uh first of all our question is uh, how this flip classroom technique is going to help laboratory based topics because it may be difficult ah. to create videos for all the topics in this class okay so this is again a good question how can we use flip classrooms in a laboratory based technique so uh, again what you can do what people have done is they have flipped the laboratory also 
So what we usually do is we do the theory part first and then we send the students to the laboratory and ask them to do something. So even in computer programming, we first teach them something and then we say, okay, go and write these programs in the laboratory. So what you can do is you can flip that part also. You can have them do some laboratory exercises first, which are far, which are simple and then they come to the classroom to get that concept to be fairly fixed. So one of the examples that I do in my class is I tell them, okay, you write this program and observe it out. So I give them a program and I say that, okay, you run this program and observe its output. Then you look at the code and try to figure out what are these things, what are these new constructs that have been used. So they will figure out that, okay, look, there seems to be some kind of repetition happening. There seems to be some kind of uh, set of items are being put together. So they will answer at that level when they do the laboratory first for topics like iteration and arrays. Okay. And then when they come to the class, you can then say that, you know, you already ran that program, you saw how the program works. This is the syntax of an array, this is the syntax of how an iteration works. And then you can go on to the higher cognitive level activities of actually writing programs for larger functions using uh, the constructs that you have taught. So to summarize, the answer is that don't wait for doing the laboratory after the theory. Merge the laboratory and the theory so that they do a little bit of the laboratory. So let's say if you are going to have weekly laboratory sessions, let them do half of the laboratory on what they have already learned and let them do half of the laboratory on what you are going to teach in the next week. So that way you can flip the lab also. Okay, so with this good question, I will, I will have to stop. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.